These images were all taken with a crop sensor Astrocam called the TubeTech ATR2600C. TubeTech may not be a name that you hear every day, but they've been manufacturing Astrocams for years now, usually rebranded as brands like Omegon, Ogma, Altair, and RisingCam, among others. This has an IMX571 sensor, and if that sounds familiar, it's because it's the same sensor as the ZWO ASI2600 series, which means that it is a crop sensor camera. And that also means that there's competition in the market, and that's great for us consumers. Before I continue, I want to thank TubeTech for sending this unit to me to test and review in this video. It is a loner, so it's going back in a couple of weeks, but I have been having a ton of fun with it whenever the weather allows me to. Besides getting this on loan, I am not getting compensated in any way for this review. So thank you TubeTech for sending this to me. This video has chapters so you can jump around and skip about as you please, especially when you don't care about certain things like the specs that I'm about to talk about right now. So as mentioned, this has an IMX571 sensor with a pixel size of 3.76 microns and a resolution of 6224 by 4168 pixels, which is actually quite larger than my APS-C DSLRs, which makes me think, like, are my DSLRs actually true crop, crop sensors? This thing weighs a little over half a kilogram or about 1.3 pounds. This has zero amp glow. Here is an example of a dark frame, a 20 minute dark frame taken at negative 10 degrees Celsius. This is also ASCOM compatible, so it'll work with pretty much any imaging software that you use. I test this with SharpCap and Nina in this video. This also comes with tech cooling, and you can go up to 42 degrees below the ambient temperature. The most I've done is 38 degrees below ambient temperature in the dead of summer. It worked really well, and it held the temperature pretty much the entire night. It comes with a built-in dew heater, which has saved me on multiple occasions. This comes with two gain modes, a high conversion gain and a low conversion gain. I'll go a little bit into what these are when I go over the sensor analysis soon. You can also use a gain from 100 to 10,000. So you'll notice that the lowest gain point is 100. So that's the lowest you can do. And 100 seems to be there you need to gain anyway. So if you just leave it at the default 100, you'll be good. It also has something called an ultra low noise mode. So I test the sensor analysis with that on as well. It's a 16 bit ADC with a normal full well capacity of 51,000 electrons. And it also has a high full well mode, which can give you 100,000 electrons, which sounds great because your dynamic range almost doubles, but it also means that you may end up getting a lot more noise. So after my initial test, I have decided that at least with this camera, high, full well mode isn't something that I would use normally for my Astro images. Now let's move on to see what came in the box. Here's a box that I was sent from TubeTech. I've seen videos of others unboxing TubeTech cameras which came with a small Pelican case-like carrier, but I didn't receive that. Inside we have the camera and some other boxes and some adapters. The TubeTech Astrocam here looks cool and feels good, and we'll take a closer look at this unit really soon. Here we have the M42 to M48 adapter at 16.5 millimeters. Then we have the M42 to M42 adapter at 21 millimeters. Together with the native 17 and a half millimeter spacing of the camera itself, we have a perfect 55 millimeters of back focus. We also have an M48 to M42 threaded adapter here if we need more M42 spacing. And finally, we have an M42 male adapter that you can switch out for the current female adapter already installed on the camera. Inside the box, we have a power brick that supplies three amps of output. Aside from quickly testing this to make sure it works, I have been supplying my own five amp power adapter. Then we have the actual power cable that plugs into the brick. And finally, a nice one and a half meters or about five foot long USB 3.0 cable. Again, just tested this to make sure it works well, but I've been using my own fast USB cable. Let's take a closer look at the Astrocam. When we take a closer look at the camera, we can see a nice shade of blue, and it matches a lot of my current primary setup, like my 71F and my guide cam pretty nicely, all unintentionally blue. As I rotate the camera around, you may notice that there is no brand labels anywhere. This is a blank unit, which may have been in line to get rebranded as one of the names that I mentioned earlier in the video. Would be cool to see an astronomy listed across here, right? The dust cap on top is a really nice rubber cover, which feels nice and strong. But man, this thing is a dust magnet. I don't even know where the dust comes from, but you can see the tiny specks of dust everywhere. Now this could mean that it's actually pulling dust away from the sensor itself, so maybe it's working as intended. Let's take a look at the sensor here. It's an APS-C crop sensor. 
Comparing this to my 533MC Pro, you can clearly see the difference in sensor size. And if you look at the image of M31 between the two, there is a huge difference. The size is also different and the tube tech is a bit heavier. On this side, we can see the vents and the large heat sinks that attach to the tech cooling behind the sensor. In the back, we have two USB 2.0 ports, uh, an input USB 3 port, and a 12 volt of power. And there are three LEDs for power, system, and tech. Looks like there used to be one for fan, but that LED is now gone and it's covered. On top here, there's a do not open label with the screw, which is tempting, but don't worry, I'm not gonna. On the front, it comes with M42 female threads that you connect to the M42 to M42 adapter, followed by the M42 to M48 adapter, which will give you the perfect 55 millimeters of backspace. You'll typically replace these adapters if you plan on using an OAG and or a filter wheel. Some cameras will have sensor adjustment screws in front. Unfortunately, this one does not come with them. The screws here just hold the adapters in place. So I mentioned earlier that if you purchase this directly from TubeTech, you'll also get a free tilt adjuster and that will come in very handy. And my unit here, my test unit here didn't come with one and I kind of wish it did. And when we look at the sensor tilt and ass tap, we can see that there's quite a bit of tilt in one of the corners. The tilt is moderate at 18%, so it's not terrible, but it's definitely large enough that it needs to be mentioned. With that said, the tilt didn't really affect any of my images. And if I hadn't done that in analysis, I wouldn't have actually even known that there was tilt. Now let's install the driver and take a look at some of the options that are available to us in SharpCap and take a look at some of the sensor analysis data that I was able to generate. All right, to download the driver from the TubeTech website, if you just go to download and you click on software, it'll be taken to this page where you have some links to download some of their drivers. And the, what we're looking for is the TubeTech Astro equipment driver for the ASCOM platform. So you'll click on download, it'll download. So let's install it. Bow, bow. And now this works, we don't need the readme. Okay, so now we can connect to this from our software. Right, so I have SharpCap started here and under my cameras, the ATR2600C should show up once the driver has been installed. If you click on this and it doesn't work for you, you wanna make sure that you have the latest version, the SP2 version of at the ASCOM drivers. You wanna install that first before you install the ATR2600 driver. So I'll click on this and it's connected to my camera. We can't see anything here because my, uh, the, lens cap is on and I, I don't need it for now because I already did the lens analysis, the sensor analysis, so we'll look at that soon. I just wanna show off the capture option that we have available to us in SharpCap. Some of this will look similar in Nina, so we'll look at them again there, but uh, I find that it'll be easier to uh, go over them in SharpCap here since we're gonna be talking about the sensor real soon. So looking at the color space, we have a few options. We have RAW 8, RAW 16, RAW 16 Ultra Low Noise, RGB 24 and mono 8. So RGB 24 and mono 8 is something that we will probably never use. You want to use your highest bit depth, which is RAW 16. And as I mentioned, there's a ultra low noise mode that comes with the TubeTech firmware. And in Nina, this is what's on by default. The first time I turned on SharpCap, it was actually RAW 8 that was defaulted to, but RAW 16 ultra low noise is what you want to use. And we'll take a look at what the sensor analysis for that came out to be. So we also have read mode, so low conversion gain and high conversion gain. By default, it's low conversion gain. And what high conversion gain does is, in layman's term, it gives you three times the sensitivity of the camera than low conversion gain, which sounds really nice. But if you use high conversion gain, you should expect more signal, but along with more signal, you'll get a lot more noise. So we have binning here. You can go all the way up to four by four here. Uh, although the camera claims that you can do up to eight by eight. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a different uh, color space that lets you do eight by eight, but I haven't been able to see that option anywhere. It's always four by four, no matter what I pick. So let's go back to here. Of course we have our analog gain here. You can see the lowest level is 100. Uh, as I mentioned, it goes from 100 to 10,000. So 100 is the unity gain, so we'll look at that in the sensor analysis as well. And you can't go below that. And I do have some comments on that that you'll hear real soon. And then we'll skip the rest of this and then we'll look at some of the results from my sensor analysis. So the first one I'll be looking at is we'll do raw 16 with low conversion gain. 
And what I have there is, so you can see the read noise and the gain that appear here. So the gain is here, the read noise is up there. And 100 gain value is the lowest it can go to. And technically it's unity gain is at 100. That's when you get the most optimal electrons per ADU. It's a lot of technical jargon here. I won't expand on that, but if anyone wants to know more, let me know. I can make another video on that. But Queeve the Lazy Geek also has a really nice video where he goes pretty deep into what ADUs are, what electrons are, gain is, etc. And on the normal RAW 18, RAW 16 mode, I was able to get to a full well depth of about 42,000, which is, which is fine. And of course, the higher the gain value, the lower the electron per ADU is. So they become a little bit more sensitive, but the read noise ratio becomes higher. Even though the read noise itself is a lower value, you need to make sure that you take this out of the full well uh, electron value here. So this is 3.13 out of 42,000, and this is 2.9 out of 20. 3,000. So the ratio there is a little, is very off. And the 2.2, even though this is the lowest, it's out of 724. So something to keep in mind there. So this is the uh, reading from raw 16 low conversion gain. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to do raw 16 with high conversion gain. So we'll look at that. All right, so we have the high conversion gain uh, with raw 16, which is the normal, not low read noise. And as I mentioned that the high conversion gain gives you about three times the sensitivity. So in the normal version, our electrons per AD was about 64. The test that you see in the documentation for the cameras has this around like 7.74, 0.75. And for high conversion gain, it's about 0 0.24, 0 0.25. So that makes sense. It's about a third of the way. So you need to multiply this by three to get to the low conversion gains, um, gain 100 value, unity gain here. But you'll also notice that the full well depth uh, also went down quite a bit. So we get a lot less noise, but the full well depth is only out of 16,000. So this, this is just one of the many reasons I wouldn't want to use high conversion gain because although we're getting more sensitivity, we'll end up getting more noise and our dynamic range will be much lower than a low conversion gain. So I'll just close these out. And the next one we're going to look at is going to be raw 16 at low conversion gain with ultra low noise. So this is the default, this is what I use, and we'll take a look, see what that is. And looking at that here, these numbers match a little bit more to what TubeTech provides in their documentation. At gain 100, our electron per ADU is 0.78. They say 0.76, so this is really close. So the read noise of 3.38 electrons and a full well depth of 51,000, a little bit over 51,000. So this all matches what TubeTech is claiming. And so this is something that, that this is the settings that I've been using for all of my images, which is just low, ultra low noise, low conversion gain at gain 100. And this gives you a lot of dynamic range here. And I ran this a couple of times and the values that you see on the screen are pretty much what I get every time I run the test. And if we look at the unity gain here, we can see that it has a unity gain of 100 according to the smart histogram unity gain test here. Of course, I did this inside, so the value could be technically could be different if I'm doing this outside. But again, since TubeTech really knows what they're doing, they set the minimum gain value of 100. That's what the unity gain is. That's what we're staying at. And that's the best option that we will use. So now we're going to connect this to Nina and see what Nina tells us there and what the options there look like. So I'm in Nina here. And after you've installed the driver and you click on the camera, you'll see that there are a few options that you can pick. And at this point, it really doesn't matter which one of these you pick because the options are going to be the same. They use the same driver. They talk to the same firmware on the same camera. So you can click on any of these. They look exactly the same, but I'm just going to stick with TubeTech, their driver. It's again, it's going to look the same. It doesn't really matter. So I also mentioned like Augma and Altair. I believe they use their own drivers and, and uh, software. So, so their options may look a little bit different, but I don't have those installed, obviously. So when we come here, we have our metadata information, like what the sensor type is, what the bare settings are, the driver versions are, the sensor size, what our max binning is. So yeah, it says four here as well. So the documentation says eight. 
Uh, but I will bring that up with TubeTech and see if they have any comments there, like why it says eight in the documentation. Maybe that just needs to be updated. And then the gain is 101. This is what I usually do. And you'll see that I can't go below 100, no matter how many times I click. I use an offset of 70. The USB limit zero to nine, so this is just a speed. You wanna do max speed, nine is the default. And the readout mode is what we saw as LCG and HCG and sharp cap, exact same thing. So I wanna make sure I use low conversion gain. And by default, this will use the 16 bit depth. And that's why I wanted to show this in sharp cap first because we can't change that here, uh, not on this window at least. And, and the way to go to 16 bit uh, ultra low read noise mode is just this ultra mode here. You just turn this on. By default, it's on so that you get the 0.76 electrons per ADU as your unity gain here. And then we have our full high full well mode. So if you don't remember from SharpCap just a few minutes ago that we didn't actually have this option. So SharpCap doesn't have this option anywhere. So we can set this to high full well mode in SharpCap and do a sensor analysis there. We can only do it in Nina here. I, I think it also shows up in ECOS. I, I'm not fully sure. So if I turn this on, it'll now use the 100,000 electrons as the limit. But again, with high full well mode, you get more signal. Sure, you get more dynamic range, but you also get more noise. You can also bin the average pixel. This uh, this will also cost you some high dynamic range. If you hover over this, it'll give you some more information. This is not one of the options that I actually played with, so I won't be speaking more than what I just said now because I don't know. So you have the target dew heater strength. So the dew heater control is up here on the top right. It's on right now. Uh, probably don't need it on here in my basement. Uh, but you can control the strength here. So it doesn't have to be four by default, it's four, but you can tone it down if it's not, if you don't need it to be too hot. And the fan speed is between zero and one, you can turn it on or off. And the LED lights, you can control this in sharp cap. I didn't show you that option, but uh, it's one of the drop down menus uh, near the middle of the page. And here, Nina is just here. You can turn it on and off. We have our sensor temperature here is 30 degrees Celsius, which is very warm. It's probably because of the dew heater. So once you turn the dew heater on, it will heat up the temperature sensor as well, especially if you're not running the cooler. But the dew heater and the cooler does work really well at the same time, because when I'm outside, I have to do them at the same time quite a bit of the time and, and they work just fine. And then the warming duration. And on the bottom right here, you know, we have our power, cooler power and temperature sensor charts here. And one of the things that blew my mind about the tech cooling system of this camera is that when I tested this and when I actually use this in the field is that it went from whatever temperature it was to my usual negative five degrees Celsius in a minute. So I'm actually going to do this now live, like in my basement here, you see that the sensor temperature is currently 37.8 degrees. We're gonna go down to negative five degrees and we'll see just how long it takes. So set 3959, so it just turned 140. So I'll just click on this. And what will, what's happening now is that you can see the fan speed went to one. So the fan turned on, the cooler turned on, and now the power, the cooler power went from near 0% all the way to 95%, I wanna say 95, 96% here. And the temperature is going down to negative five degrees. So again, remember our starting point is here around one minute, 140. And then we'll fast forward this a little bit. Actually, we can see the cooler power here, which is at 93.44%. All right, so now it's at one minute 40, well, one hour, 142, around like 10 seconds. So it took about, two minutes, little over two minutes to get to the negative five degrees Celsius mark. You can see that it's still going. So it's gonna plop back up. It's gonna warm back up to negative uh, five degrees once the cooler power goes down a little bit, but it is super fast. Of course, it took a little bit longer because it, it's actually pretty warm here in my basement right now. It's still pretty hot. And of course the dew heater turned the camera's temperature to 37 degrees. So it had to drop down from 37 degrees all the way to negative five degrees. I'll run this test again later and two minutes is really good and I am still really impressed with how fast this cools. Compared to my 523MC Pro, depending on how hot it is, it can take six, seven minutes to fully get down to temperature, negative five degrees, and a little bit longer to settle to that, to that temperature before I start imaging. Otherwise, the fluctuation is just a little bit too much for my liking. And the one thing I didn't mention is that the 523MC Pro it has, is a little bit more of a closed system where Moisture doesn't really get between the sensor and the protective glass in the front. 
the I can't say the same for the ATR 2600C because I think it's a little bit more open, more moisture goes in there more easily. And pretty much every time I've gone outside where the humidity has been like above 80%, there's dew on the actual uh, AR glass here. So I do have to end up using the dew heater uh, quite often in my setups. And we look at the screen here, a uh, couple more minutes later, it has settled on to like negative five degrees Celsius, around 60% cooling power. Looking at a live session in Nina, I'm imaging the ghost of Cassiopeia and zooming in, we can see some noise as the image is auto stretched by Nina, but the stars look fine and the aberration inspector doesn't reveal any defects. Looking at my sequencer, I'm taking 300 second exposures through my L Extreme filter where I dither every three frames. Since it's colder outside, the cooler power is at negative five degrees Celsius and the power is only at less than 30%. The IEAF reveals that it's 16.42 degrees outside, so we're about 30 degrees below ambient temperature. If you want to know anything more about the TubeTech 2600C, let me know in the comments below. Overall, I'm very impressed with the camera and I think it has a lot of potential. I've had a lot of fun with it and I'm sad that I have to return it so soon. At the time of recording, the camera is on sale for $1,424. If you purchase it directly from TubeTech, there is a referral link in the description below. So if you are considering buying one of these, please consider using one of those links. I want to get myself one of these, but $1,400 is quite a big swing, especially in an eclipse year where I've spent so much money already, but it is on my wish list, and maybe I'll get around to this when the holidays come around in a few months. Just to summarize some of the things that I've already covered, uh, just some of the things that I like about this camera is that first it cools really fast compared to my 533MC Pro, this cools super fast. Even with the built-in dew heater in our test, we saw that it went from 37 degrees Celsius to negative five degrees Celsius in about two minutes, which is really impressive. This is ASCOM compatible, so I didn't have any trouble at all connecting this to any of my computer or any of my setups. And of course, my test revealed that there is no amp glow, so it matches what TubeTech has reported in their documentation and on their website. And the sensor analysis test that I ran also matches pretty much what TubeTech has said on their website and in their manual, so I'm really happy to see that. And we should go by their numbers and not the numbers that I showed you from my test because I'm sure that their testing environment is a lot more pristine than my basement office here. I do find it interesting that the lowest gain you can set is 100, but like I said in the sensor analysis part of this video is that at gain 100, the full well depth does fill up to 51,000 electrons as they stated in their documentation. So going any lower wouldn't really do you any better. The values would probably be the same. So I don't know if they needed to manufacture this a little bit differently so that we can get closer to unity gain where it's one electron per ADU, but just from using this, I, I don't think it really matters that much anyway. So 100 gain as the lowest value is, is fine in my books. But there are two things that I would change about this if I could right now. The first is the sensor tilt. So I don't know if they can manufacture this in a way that it comes perfectly flat. I know it's really difficult, especially when we're looking at it pixel by pixel, that it's really difficult to do so. And it does help that when you purchase this normally, you would get a free tilt adapter. So you wouldn't normally have that issue if you're ordering directly from TubeTech and you get the tilt adapter. Unfortunately for me, I don't have a tilt adapter that I could use for many of my other setups. Uh, and one didn't come with this, so I had no choice just to live with the tilt. But as we saw in my image analysis, it didn't really matter. The tilt was not significant enough that my stars started to look weird, started to change shapes, everything looked perfectly fine. And I didn't even know that there was a sensor tilt until I ran that image analyzer in ASTAP. The second thing I would change is this is this cover. You know, like the, from the beginning of the video, and I just say it's nice. It does feel nice, but uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, it's, it's a dust magnet no matter where I go. So I do walk around with my blower, my uh, Joko blower, you know, so I, the dust does get into the protective AR. A cover here so it's fine it's not the end of the world but man I don't know what this thing is made out of it's just rubber and it's just a few things that I think that would attract more customers by tube tech is first include a few more accessories so the tilt plate is a start I unfortunately didn't get the pelican like pelican case like protective case that I've seen other people 
in their unboxing videos of TubeTech cameras. So you probably get that, but that's actually not included in their manual or on their website as parts that are included. So those could have been just special orders. So including a case would be nice. Another accessory they can give you is a one and a quarter inch nose piece so that you can actually use this on telescopes that don't have threads that you can screw this onto. Uh, my 533MC Pro did come with one, so I have used that for planetary images because that goes into a Barlow lens that doesn't screw in. So something like that would be nice. And of course, maybe a lower price. I know that's really hard to do, especially when you consider manufacturing costs, cost of paying all the employees, the overhead, everything else that's involved. But the price for this isn't that much lower than its competitors. And I think that if TubeTech wants to take over some of the market, coming in later into the game, although they do rebrand their cameras and sell it under other names, like if they want name recognition, if they want more people to be interested in these is to attract customers with a lower price. But again, that's just wishful thinking on my part. But you do get two years of warranty with this. Uh, I don't believe that they have anywhere in the United States that you can send this camera to for repairs if they need it. But talking to customer service at TubeTech, talking to uh, their agents there, they respond extremely fast. Since it's all coming from China, the longest I've had to wait is about 14 or 15 hours for a response, but they're super fast, super quick, and they also ship really fast. So when they sent me this testing unit, between the time they said, hey, we sent it to you, and the time we, I received it was 72 hours, less than 72 hours, which was really impressive. Kudos to TubeTech for creating a great product. Kudos to them for branching out and selling their cameras that they have been rebranding for other companies as their own. I think they do deserve the recognition. I think they do deserve their own sales. They do deserve people to know their name. And I have a couple more weeks with this and I will use this as much as I can, as much as the weather would let me. So please enjoy all of these images that I have taken with the TubeTech ATR2600C. Clear skies.